stand together for the Lord because the Lord thy God is with us this evening. Amen. Hallelujah. This is amazing grace. Thank God for his grace and his mercy this evening. Amen. Just love the person next to you as we sing. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness. Hallelujah.
house and we can honor him with our lives this evening. Amen. All right. We want to just sing a, a couple of choruses just for Sister Tammy. All right. These, these are her favorite um, choruses whenever she comes to Trinidad. She loves to hear these choruses. Why make her jump like popcorn? She pops up. Okay, so I just want you all to really sing along this evening so she can have a joyful and great time this evening. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, here we go. Oh, lift them higher, higher and higher.
He's worthy. He's worthy of our praise. Hallelujah. Woo. Yes. Hallelujah. Woo. I love that part. It says God is not dead. Amen. He's alive. He's alive. Is he alive in you tonight? Amen. Woo. Y'all sound good tonight. I like praising with you all. Woo. Thank you, Jesus. Woo. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that you are alive. Hallelujah. You live and you reign. And I thank you for that, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So we sang this song the other night. We're going to make this declaration again that God is the God of the city and the nation and the people. Amen. Can you do that with me tonight? Can we make this declaration again?
praise you, God, because you said that the ladder will be greater. And I declare that in our world, that the ladder will be greater. I thank you, God, that you're the alpha and you're the omega and you're the beginning and you're the end. No matter what happens, no matter what we see in the natural, remember, don't look to the natural. Keep looking to the Spirit of God. Just trust God because He's the Alpha and He's the Omega. And every knee's going to bow and every tongue's going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? No matter what happens in the natural, no matter what we see in the natural, amen?
lift your hands and lift your voice. Bless his name tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Lift your you voice and shout hallelujah and give him praise. We glorify your name, Father. We are not ashamed to call your name tonight, Lord, and we identify with you, Lord. For we know, God, that all things are possible with you, Lord, and nothing is impossible to them that believe, oh God. We worship your name. Lift your hands and lift your voice. As you sang now, lift your voice and bless the Lord with your praise. Give him praise. Give him praise. Give him praise. Give him praise. I praise you, Lord, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I praise you, Lord, because you're my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? I praise you, Lord, because you're my pavilion, my rock, my refuge, and my fortress. I praise you, Lord, because you are my shepherd, I shall not want. I praise you, Lord, because I'm dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. I'm biding under the shadow of the Almighty. I can say tonight, you are my refuge, you're my Lord. I've made you, even the Most High, my habitation. Lord, I thank you tonight for you promised to perfect that which concerns me, Lord. I give you glory. I give you honor. I salute you. You are my Lord. You are my King. You are my Creator. You are my Savior. You are my soon coming King. You are my King who is coming back to rapture me from this earth. I thank you, Lord, for you are the leader of this ministry. You are the leader of my life, O oh God. For you indeed I follow. For you are guiding the steps of every good man. And I give you praise, Lord, for keeping our eyes on you, Lord Jesus. I thank you. I look unto you tonight, the often finisher of my faith, O oh God. In you I believe and in you I live and move and have my being, Lord. I just want to praise you, God, because I can depend upon you. You are my strong tower. Even when the enemy comes in like a flood, you promise to raise up a standard against him, Lord. I just want to praise you. I just want to praise you. I thank you, Lord, for giving us the authority to bind the works of the enemy and every attack of Satan that is coming against us, coming against our health, our families, our homes. We thank you, God, for giving us power over all the powers of the enemy tonight. Somebody give him praise. Give him praise for your breakthrough. Intercept the works of darkness. As you begin to praise God, he will dispatch his angels from heaven to, to execute his word for your life and for your ministry and for your benefits. Give him praise for all his benefits tonight. For the Lord is good and his mercies endures forever. He forgives, he heals, he redeems, he crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. He's satisfying your mouth with good things. He's renewing your youth daily as the eagle. Lift up your voices, lift up your hands and give him praise. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you, Jesus. Bless the Lord for my soul and all that is within me. Bless your holy name. Bless your holy name. Glory to God. We are standing on holy grounds. We are worshiping a holy God who is sovereign over the whole earth. And there is none like Him. He is the true and living God. He is the God of Abraham. He is the God of Isaac. He is the God of Jacob. He is the God of Israel. We are glad to be serving the true and living God who promised He's going to show Himself strong in the earth and every nation shall behold His glory and every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess and soon and very soon He's going to shake the heavens He's going to shake the earth and that which cannot be shaken will remain we are grateful tonight that we have a foundation that is unshakable unmovable, unstoppable we thank God tonight for the foundation we have is a sure word of God we thank you for your authentic, the authenticity of your word the unadulterated word our foundation, our hope. I praise you, Lord. I know why I'm praising you. I have a reason to praise you tonight. I have a reason to glorify your name. I have a reason to lift my voice tonight. Glory to God. This is not unto man. This is not unto man. This is unto you who are holy. I worship you. I declare your glory. I declare your glory. The earth is filled with your glory, Lord. Touch us, O oh God. Give us a touch from your throne tonight. Minister your grace to us, Lord. Help us to give you exceptional praise. Help us to praise you with excellence. Help us to praise you with a resilient spirit. Help us to praise you with enthusiasm and zeal and energy and charisma. Thank you, Lord, that we can stand in your presence. Not ashamed. Not ashamed. Not ashamed to lift up the name of Jesus. Not ashamed. Hallelujah. And all the people of God said, Amen and Amen and Amen. Would you be kind enough to put your hands together and bless, bless the Lord tonight? Would you do that? Thank you, Jesus. He's your strength. He's your helper. He's your everything tonight. He's your everything tonight. Glory to God. When you stand in the presence and you begin to worship God, you don't, you don't want to compromise a second. Give Him total worship, total focus. Tell somebody, say, total focus. Glory to God. You don't care about any other human being when you're worshiping God. It's you and God. It's, it's you and God, nobody else. Don't let nobody distract you. Don't let nobody presence, personality, or perfume, or cologne distract you. In the presence of God, you are one on one. One on one, life to life. Glory to God in the presence of God. Forget about everything. He alone is worthy to be praised. Slap some over at high five. Say, I don't joke in the presence of God. Amen. And the Lord bless you real good. You can be seated. Praise the Lord. Pleasant good evening. Good to have you in the presence of the Lord tonight. Good to see every one of you. In our midweek service and tonight is a wonderful night we have special folks with us special visitors with us tonight and we appreciate this team amen amen if you appreciate this team put your hands together and just bless them tonight glory to god for those of you who were here sunday night we had a wonderful time amen and we had a great time sunday night say amen praise the lord and we just thank god for what he is doing and those of you who are here for intercessory prayer this morning, thank you so much. To God be the glory. Amen. Here's what we want to do tonight. We want to turn this place into a classroom. So everybody, all of you in the back, come forward, please. Everybody, come forward. Please. Rise up. Get up. Walk to the front. And fill up these places here. Gentlemen, take this pulpit down there, would you please? Praise the Lord. Amen. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Are you ready to receive from the Lord tonight? 
Are you ready to receive God's word tonight? Amen. Amen. For those of you who joined us tonight, thank you for doing so wherever you are. It's a pleasure to come into your homes and wherever you are. And it's an opportunity for us to minister God's grace to you. Tonight, I guarantee you the Lord will not disappoint you. The Bible said, whosoever hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. And if you're hungry for God and desperate for God, he will not disappoint you. Open your spirit and let God minister to you tonight and prepare you for whatever he has in store for you and for what's coming through this world. God bless you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Put your hands together. Welcome our national, regional, international audience. God bless you. We love you. Praise the Lord. Amen. And again, again, tonight we are going to give our speaker enough time to share and minister to you. And I want you to open your heart and open your spirit to receive tonight. Amen. Tell somebody say it's time to receive tonight. Glory to God. Amen. It's time to receive tonight. And, uh, and uh, I just want him to know that we uh, enjoyed you thoroughly, your ministry. We enjoyed your ministry thoroughly. And uh, you have the liberty tonight to use this platform and follow the Holy Spirit. Just obey the Holy Spirit. Would you be kind enough? Put your hands together and welcome Dr. Mickey Walters as she comes to minister to you tonight. God bless you. Thank you, man. Appreciate you. Well, good evening. How are we doing tonight? We doing good? Well, you know, kind of shake it off. Shake, shake off the weariness. Shake off maybe some of the, you know, this week has been a week, hasn't it? It's been a week. How many of you have had some trials and tribulations just since Monday? Anybody had any trials and tribulations? Well, my goodness gracious, what a on-fire place. <clears throat> but I want to uh, thank, first of all, my team that has come down and just been enthralled with you because you have absolutely touched their lives. Their thinking was probably we're going to come down and touch your lives, but you know what? You have touched our lives, and I'm sure that every one of them can attest tonight. But tonight, I don't want to get, uh, I don't want to be delayed. Tonight is a classroom setting. Now, just picture yourself in a classroom and pretend you're in Tampa at the Bible school and you've come to class. That you've come to class. This class is about the Old Testament and about the New Testament. And I want to lay the groundwork of understanding the need for both. There is a need in our life for the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. Some denominations teach that when Jesus came along, that did away with the Old Testament. That did not do away with the Old Testament. Some teach that the Old Testament was abolished when Jesus died for our sins and all the standards changed. But as we get along and, and go along, we will see the difference. Now, I've got some handouts tonight. You're, we're we're going to have a classroom session. Okay, is that all right with everybody? We're going to have a classroom session. So, Tammy, start passing those out, okay? It's, it's really exciting whenever you get into understanding truly about the Old Testament and about the New Testament. The understanding that the Old Testament really is sort of a foreshadow of the New Testament. Whenever God created this earth he said it was good he said it was good why was it so good because he created it amen he created this earth he created everything that there is that you see that you feel and that you touch now some of you have the papers some of you don't but let me tell you this, the Bible is a unified book. There are differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament in many ways, though, but they complement each other. 
In the Old Testament, there is 39 books to the Bible in the Old Testament. There's 27 books in the New Testament. So what does that make? Get your math out. How many books in the Bible? 66. That's right. 66 books in the Bible. And every one of them has Jesus in them. Every one has Jesus in them. See, how many of you know who wrote the Bible? Anybody can tell me who wrote the Bible? Okay, all right, all right. Now, who wrote the Bible? There was different authors. There was 40 different people that contributed to penning the Bible. And they came from all walks of life. They came from all, now remember, I'm teaching you, this is classroom. We're not going to romp and stomp tonight, okay? But we're going to learn something tonight. Maybe you know this already, but let me just say I may be a little repetitive, but that's okay. It doesn't hurt to hear it again, right? So, who wrote the Bible? Forty different people wrote the Bible from all walks of life. Now, as you think about it, there was shepherds, there was farmers, there was a tent makers, there was physicians, there was fishermen, there was priests, and there was kings. But every bit of the Bible was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Was inspired by the Holy Spirit. See, the Old Testament is foundational. That's what it is. It's a foundation. We find in Genesis, looking at Genesis, and I want us to go there, all right? Genesis 1, and we're going we're gonna to do a, a synopsis, you might say, on 1 through 31. But the Bible tells us, and it's foundational, it tells us in 1, 1, in the beginning... God created the heavens of the earth. Now, that's pretty basic. That's pretty basic. He made the heavens and the earth. Now, I kind of understand this. This earth was formless and void, and the darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved over the surface of the waters. When we look at the Old Testament, chapter 1 is a synopsis of all of the uh, first, uh, of all the Old Testament. It's a synopsis of it. But there was a span of time. There were so many things that went on in the Old Testament. But there was a span of time that God did not speak to man. There was 400 years that God did not speak anything at all. But in the New Testament builds on the foundation of the Old Testament with further revelation from God. See, the Old Testament establishes principles that seem to be illustrated Illustrative of the New Testament truths. All through the Old Testament is looking forward, going forward to the New Testament. See, the Old Testament provides the history of people. But the New Testament focuses on one person. And that one person is Jesus Christ. The New Testament focuses on that one person. But the Old Testament shows the wrath of God against sin. The Old Testament shows the wrath of God against sin. But the New Testament shows the grace of God towards sin. See, in the Old Testament... God got so upset, he said to Noah, 
Turn with me to Genesis 6. Turn with me to Genesis 6. Well, and let's look at 7. Let's, let's go, to, go ahead to 7. It says, The Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark. And he told him to build an ark. But let's look at Genesis 6.6. 6. Yes, let's go there. It says, The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I had created from the face of this earth, from man to animals to creeping things and birds of the sea. And he says, I am so sorry that I have made them. At that point in time, do we realize what God did? He blotted out every human being that was ever born up to this point. You know why? Simply because of the sin and the violence that had been created. We're living in a day of sin and violence. We're living in a day when people get mad and upset at the least little thing. And not only that, they're pulling out guns and shooting. We're living in a day of violence. Woe to be us. Woe unto us. So we, we find, you know, we find that God found one man. One man. Anybody know who that man was? He found Noah that loved him. And he found his, and so what he did is that he told Noah to go and build this great big boat, this great big ship. Now, let me just kind of give you a side thing here. In the United States, just this past year, a man had a vision to build Noah's Ark. And in a, a, in a state called Kentucky, anybody ever heard of Kentucky? In a state called Kentucky, he built to scale Noah's Ark. It is the most magnificent sight that you could ever see. What a visual to realize what God said to do. And not only that, this man and his family built this ship. People laughed at him. People jeered at him. People said, what in the world are you doing? But he was listening to the voice of God. Hear me and hear me well. Listen to the voice of God when he speaks to you. Because God's going to tell you some things to do in this coming time and these years to come, these months to come, these weeks to come. God is going to speak to your heart if you'll have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. Noah had ears to hear what God was saying. Now you can imagine, what if God came and told you to go build this great big boat on land, not even near the water? What would you think about it? Would you be obedient? Would you be as obedient as he was? Selah on that one. Now, the New Testament shows the grace of God towards sin we live in the age of grace thank God that we do living in the in the age of grace if you would turn with me to John first chapter 14th verse John first chapter 14th verse it says and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace 
and full of truth. Jesus brought the grace that you and I have today. He brought that grace to us. Now the Old Testament prophesies about the Messiah. Jesus was the Messiah. Isaiah 53, looking at verse uh, 3 and 7, it speaks about the Messiah. Turn with me there because I want you to mark these particular scriptures. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 says, He is despised and rejected of men and a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it was faced for him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. When we look at that scripture, we see that what Isaiah 53 was saying, he was prophesying the Messiah. When you look at Isaiah 7.14, you're right there. Isaiah 7.14. What does that say? It says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign, and behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Who was that? That was Jesus that was born of a virgin and conceived. All that prophecy about the coming Messiah was right there in the Old Testament. So you can't tell me that you do it, did away with the Old Testament whenever the New Testament came about. You can't tell me that. Isaiah 9, 6. Looking at Isaiah 9, 6. It says... For unto a child is born, for unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. All the names of Jesus Christ. Amen? All the names of Jesus Christ. Now the New Testament reveals who the Messiah is. Whenever we read John 1, 1, in the beginning, in the beginning, but we're going to read the whole part. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. The Word was with God. John 4 25 and 26 said the woman said to him I know the Messiah is coming he who is called Christ and when he comes he'll tell us all things you see the New Testament reveals who the Messiah is now the Old Testament records the giving of God's law but the New Testament shows how Jesus the Messiah Fulfilled the law. See, the first five books of the Bible, which is called the Pentateuch, is the book of law. It was written between 1450 and 1410 B.C., the Old Testament. I mean, the uh, first five books of the Bible. First five books of the Bible written by Moses. Good, I see some affirmative heads shaking here. That, that's good, you know that. That's, that's excellent. But you see, the Old Testament recall, uh, records the giving of God's law. But the New Testament shows how Jesus the Messiah fulfilled it. When you look at Matthew chapter 3, well, let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 17. Think not that I am coming to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. You see, Jesus came to fulfill the law. He didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. Matthew, um, <clears throat> yeah, Matthew 3.17. Matthew 3.17. Can we go there? There we go. 
John, though, also in John 3, 16. But let's do go to Romans, Romans 8, 29 to 32. Romans 29 to 32. It says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did press, pre, um, <laughs> That's right, that's what he did. To be conformed to the image of his son and that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So Hebrews 10, 9 said, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus Christ. But the Old Testament, God deals, dealings are mainly with his chosen people, the Jews. I hope you're tracking me. Okay. See, the Jewish people, this is what was their pattern. They would disobey. He would get upset. He'd deal with them. They would repent. He would forgive. And they would do it all over again. How many of us have done that? How many of us have done that to God? How many of us have said, God, <clears throat> you get me out of this trouble and I'll never do it again. He gets you out of the mess that you're in and sure enough, you know what happens? You do it again. So he says that they would disobey, he would get upset, he would deal with it. They would repent, he would forgive, and they'd do it all over again. And he got sick and tired of that and decided he wasn't going to talk for 400 years. But praise God, praise God that we Gentiles have the opportunity, have the opportunity and the privilege of being a part of, of, of Jesus Christ. See, New Testament God dealings is mainly with his church. In Matthew 16, 18, he says, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, the church is the people. It isn't this building. This building, if this building wasn't here, there still would be a church because you're the church. See, God is building you. The New Testament, God is dealing with the church. And every one of us in this room have things that God is dealing with in our life. None of us are perfect. God is dealing with us in, in many different areas. And with that dealing, how is he dealing with us? He's given us the New Testament to live by. He's given us, yeah, I, if we wanted to put a, a title on the uh, message tonight, I, uh, I wrote the title down, if I can find it. I wrote the title down, and I wrote it as, The Bible is the Standard for Our Life. Stop and think about that. The Bible is the standard for life, and it's the manual for you and I to live by. And God has provided in his word what we need in our life to live by. God has given us his grace. Praise God for the grace. Where would we be without grace in our life? Where would we be? Where would we be if Jesus Christ had not come and died on the cross for you and I? Where would we be had we not been accepted as Gentiles into the kingdom of God? Where would we be? But by the grace of God, by the grace of God, you and I came to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. 
So he says to Peter, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. You see, you are the church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. It doesn't make any difference what happens. We all have trauma. We all have drama. We all have things that happen in our life. But my promise to me and to you is the gates of hell shall not prevail against me. It doesn't mean that the enemy will not come in and try to persuade you, influence you, talk into your ear. You can do this and you can do that. We live in a society right now where anything goes, but anything doesn't go for the Christian. We live, and you and I are to live a consecrated life before the Lord. And we have been persuaded because of a lot of things in the media. We have been persuaded. It's okay. Everybody's doing it. Why can't I do it? As a matter of fact, some people think, what difference does it make? Nobody knows what I'm doing. You know, who knows what you're doing is God. There's no way to escape God. Just understand that. There's no way to escape God. God. See, physical blessings are promised, physical blessings are promised under the old covenant to spiritual blessings under the new covenant. By grace you are saved. By grace. New Testament brings into the sharper focus principles that were introduced into the Old Testament. See, uh, a lot of things that we see, a lot of the principles that we have, and a lot of the principles that we live by, that, that the New Testament brings in, it was in the Old Testament. Do you understand how important the Old Testament, it laid the groundwork for the foundation that we have in our life. The New Testament brings that sharper into focus. How many of you know? We got to focus. We got to focus. We got to focus. We got to focus. Because if we don't, we will lose it and we will be swayed this way and that way. But it brings in the New Testament, brings into sharper focus the principles that were introduced into the Old Testament. See, the Old Testament gives the law. The New Testament clarifies that the law was meant to show men their need for salvation. How many of you know somebody that's not saved? Anybody know somebody that doesn't know Jesus in that personal way? Do you know what God has called you to do? God has called you to introduce those people to Jesus. It's time that we get out of the four walls out of our comfort zone and we can we can be very comfortable in church we can be very comfortable with our christian friends because we all speak the same language we all serve the same god but then when you get out into the working world are you a secret service christian You know, would anybody know that you were a Christian by the way you conduct your life, by the way you talk, by the way that people would know around you? They better not cuss. They better not tell dirty jokes. You know why? Because of who you stand for. Your witness and your life is more important than what you say. People aren't listening to what you're saying. They're looking at your life. They're looking at your walk. They're looking at, oh, yeah, is this what you're saying? Well, I don't see it in your life. So we have a job. And you know what? We're put in the spotlight. It's not easy being a Christian. 
It's not easy. It is not easy being a Christian. Because what happens is that old Adamic nature rises up sometimes. Remember we talked about anger. I tell you what, you know what? That's not godlike. Anger is not godlike. And so it rises up. We have things in our life that rise up that we have to overcome. See, we have been given the scriptures. That's why knowing the word of God is so important because this Bible will help you overcome any adversities in your life. Knowing the word, being confident in the word, being confident talking to people about the word. Be confident in what you're saying. Be confident in your life. And let people know, yes, I am a Christian. Christians are forgiven. They're not perfect. Christians are forgiven. They're not perfect. There's only one perfect one. The day you become perfect is when you meet him face to face. Amen. That's the day that we come perfect. But the Old Testament, as I said gives the law, but the New Testament clarifies that the law was meant to show men the need for salvation. See, there's a contrast. There's a contrast between the Old and the New Testament, but they complement each other. And the foundation was laid in the, New, in the Old Testament for what we have today. The Old Testament saw paradise lost. In Adam. Adam failed. And some of you may say, oh, no, 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 it wasn't Adam. It wasn't Adam. Some of you men might say that. It was Eve. It was that woman, God, that you gave me. That's what Adam said. But if you read the scriptures carefully, read the scriptures very carefully, where it says, yes, it was beautiful. I mean, that fruit looked really good. It went, mmm, yum, yum, yum. But you see, Adam knew. He knew what would happen if they ate from the tree of good and evil. He knew. And do you think he didn't tell Eve? I think he told Eve. I think they talked about it even from time to time in some of their little chatty conversations. But there was a temptation that was brought before her. And that temptation overtook her. And she took that fruit and she ate of it. But what's so ironic is that he was standing there right beside her. And you know what she did? She took that fruit, she took a bite, and then she gave it to him. And you know what? He took the bite. And so that's why the Old Testament shows you paradise lost. They would have had lived forever in paradise. But because they succumb to the temptations of the enemy, oh, smutty face, the devil, because they succumb to that, they lost paradise. But the New Testament shows you how paradise recame through the second Adam, which was Jesus Christ, which was Jesus Christ. So the Old Testament declares that man was separated from God through sin. But the New Testament declares that man can be restored in his relationship through the Son, Jesus Christ. Amen? See, Old Testament prophecy, I mean, Old Testament prophesied the Messiah's life. And you find that in Psalms. 22, verses 16 through 18. Psalms 22, verses 16 and 18. Turn with me there. 
Well, you can see it on the screen. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have encoursed me, they pierce my hands and my feet. So what we see, what we see here is the Old Testament prophecy of the Messiah's life. The Gospels record Jesus' life. And the epistles interpret his life and how we're supposed to respond to all that he did for us. Now, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, three of those Gospels were synoptic. One gave the details and accuracy. See, when we look at the Gospels, Matthew wrote about the king. Mark wrote about the servant, the Luke wrote about a man, and John wrote about the deity of Jesus Christ. All four of them went from a different perspective. How many of you have ever talked to somebody, told them a story, and then, I dropped my earring, then they relayed that story they relayed that story to somebody else. Thank you. And when they relayed that to somebody else, there was a twist to it. There was a difference to it. But whenever you read the Gospels of Jesus Christ, I'm going to put the earring back on because all you're going to do is stare at my ear. <laughs> there we go. Okay. But when we look at four of the Gospels, they were all truth. They were all truth. But each one of them did it from a perspective of their own. How many of you have ever seen something and a bunch of people have been together and they looked at it one way, this one looked at it another way. But praise God, between the four Gospels, it gave us a whole perspective of what Jesus Christ was like. Amen? So, I mean, we, we needed that. We needed that. See, 14 books of the Bible in the New Testament, Paul wrote for us. And what he wrote was that the epistles interpreted life and how we're supposed to respond to all that he's done for us. And all of those epistles, it tells us how to live. It tells us how to walk this walk. It tells us how to be overcomers. It tells us in his word exactly how we can be overcomers in this life. The Old Testament lays the foundation for the coming of the Messiah who would sacrifice himself for the sins of the world. And 1 John 2.2 2, he is the advocate for our sins. Not for only us, but also for the sins of this world. He was the advocate for our sins. New Testament records the ministry of Jesus Christ and then looks back on what he did and how we are to respond. You and I, need to live a thankful life. We need to be thankful for what Jesus did for us. See, a lot of times if we're not careful, we'll take what Jesus did for us and we'll take it for granted. Or we'll just take it as reading something on a piece of paper. But how many of you in here that are mothers would sacrifice your son? It was a great sacrifice for God to sacrifice his son. Any of you that have children, you understand what I'm saying. New Testament records the ministry of Jesus Christ in the Gospels. And as Paul wrote the epistles, it was the way of life, the standard of life that you and I are to live. You see, we weren't put here on the earth for ourselves. We were put here on earth to do the work for God. 
All of us have tent jobs, but that is not our main job. It is not our main job. Our main job is to bring people to Jesus Christ. Well, how can I do that? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of timid. Well, the Bible tells us not to be timid, right? It says, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And the word there is not fear in the original Greek. What it is is timidity. God has not given you a spirit of timidity, and it's time that you rise up, be bold, be bold for Jesus Christ, because if you aren't, you're the one that's going to lose out on the victories in Christ. Amen? So we have to step out and be that voice. We are the voice of God here on earth right now. You and I. And you say, well, I don't know the scriptures that well. It's time to learn. Time to get into the word of God. Don't let things of this world and distractions of this world rob you from the things of God and rob you from the victory of bringing someone to Christ. Amen? So both testaments reveal the same holy, merciful and righteous God who condemns sin but desires to save sinners through the anointment, the atonement. So you see, God orchestrated our life. He orchestrated the New Testament, the Old Testament, and the New Testament. Both testaments reveal and share the same holy, merciful, righteous God who condemns sin. I'm repeating that. But desires to save sinners through the atonement sacrifice. Through both of the Old Testament and New Testament, God, he reveals his self to us. And shows us how to come to him through faith. It's our faith. See, we can't see, we can't feel, and we can't touch God. You and I are standing here, sitting here tonight. And the reason that we're here is that we have faith. That Jesus is who he says he is in the New Testament. That's why you and I are here today. That's why you and I walk around in our right mind. Because this mind should be the mind of Jesus Christ. Genesis 15, 6 says, and he believes the Lord, and he counted him to be righteous. But in Ephesians 2, 8, <clears throat> excuse me, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing, but it is a gift of God. And I say to you tonight, study. First of all, study to show yourself approved, rightly dividing the word of God. I'm saying learn the Old Testament, learn the New Testament, so that you have confidence and boldness and can stand up for Jesus Christ. And do not let anybody persuade you in any other direction. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you and thank you so much. It's been wonderful. Pastor. Okay, you feel like you're in Bible school tonight. Amen. Enjoy that? It widens, it widens your knowledge in understanding God's word so you can relate it and 
can interpret numerous things to people who are concerned about truth and who wants truth, who wants to know the truth. And the Bible is the foundation of truth. It is truth itself. And Jesus is truth personified. How many you learned something tonight? I said, how many of you learned something tonight? See, sometimes you think coming to church is just to jump on all, all, all the places and just get hyper and all these things. When you come here, you want to hear God talk to you. You want to leave here with more knowledge than you came in. You depend upon the Holy Spirit to reveal to you. Always take what you learn, what you know. Apply it to yourself and share it with somebody else. People need to know the truth because that's the only way they're going to be made free. Are you with me tonight? And I always like to, to focus on what is coming to the world to the nations of the world and that those things that I see the things that I see motivates me to live appropriately and adjust my life and to help others do the same as we see the day of the Lord approaching I commend all of you for being here tonight and when you when you know the truth apply it to your life and you you may you you manage your life and you're free you feel f that freedom that liberty that Christ has made a difference in your life with when you understand liberty and you try to share the truth with other people and they reject you and they despise you and reject the truth I want to say something to you tonight for those of you who evangelize and those of you who share the gospel to other people you are never responsible for the pain of those who have ignored your counsel you're not responsible for the pain that people are enduring. And for those who have rejected your teaching or your preaching or your evangelizing, whatever you're doing, your witnessing, who reject the truth. You are not responsible for the pain that they're going through. People have to make a decision that will make a difference in your life. You can only present truth to people's minds so they can think and make a decision. But I tell you this, it pains your heart to see people reject truth. It pains your heart to see people enduring pain when they could come out of it. And the reason why you go through pain, because pain tells you there's a real enemy exist. Isn't that true? And so you are, you become the eternal hope for those who, for those who are living in your home who do not know Jesus. You become, you become the eternal hope for that person. So think about that person living in your house who don't know Jesus Christ or the relative who is connected to you who don't know Jesus Christ. Think about this fact. You are the eternal hope for that person. Now consider that in your mind. When someone in your family, when someone in your family will not follow Jesus or the Jesus you love, you must picture the eternal consequence if they do not follow Jesus. So think about those people that you witness to or you are not witnessing to in your home. If they reject the eternal truth, think of the consequence of their, reject, their rejecting truth. And folks, nobody wants to go to heaven here and leave your loved ones to go to hell. Are you with me? Nobody. You picture the eternal consequence if they do not follow Jesus and that will motivate you to do something about what you know that they don't know. Am I talking parables or something? Anybody understand what I'm saying? How many of you know somebody in your home right now who don't know Jesus Christ? 